This is my official testimony. I'm excited to share it with you guys. Um, I'm excited to share my journal, some clips I'm gonna share with you later, so don't miss that. My journal's right here. I'm gonna read through it. I've, I've debated whether I was gonna do this because of some of the stuff is just a bit wild in it, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, we're family. So basically, you know, my upbringing, I had an incredible childhood. My childhood was amazing. My parents are both watching this. They raised us in incredible. I was born in San Jose, California at eight years old. I moved to a city called Manteca, California. My parents wanted to bring us out to the country and we lived an awesome life. We had dirt bikes and horses and property. My dad worked incredible, you know, incredibly hard overtime to buy us everything we can have. We were never abused. My parents never drank. I never heard my parents cuss. My parents literally were just incredible, clean people that raised us in church. So let me make this clear that I was raised in the church. I was raised in the pews. I grew up until the age of 16 years old going to church. My parents taught us about God. They read us the Bible. They taught us the ways of God all growing up as a child. But the, here was the problem that the Holy Spirit's power was never real in my life. And I wanted you to, many of you to know that you can be raised in church and not raised in Christ. And that's my story. I was raised in church, but never had an experience with the Holy Spirit, never had an experience with the power of God. So at 16, I decided God isn't real. I'm not going to serve God anymore. Uh, I'm going to go to a job. I got a job at 15 and a half. I graduated high school at 16 years old. I always got taught you work hard you're driven, you graduate, you go to college. And so at 16, I graduated and started going to a junior college at 16 years old. I had a job. I was working 40 hours a week. I was taking 18 units in, in college. I'm this young guy thinking I have my whole life planned out. I wanted to become a police officer. That was my dream my entire life. I was little. They said, Isaiah, you'll get over it. And I grew up and I said, I want to be a police at 10 years old. They said, you'll grow out of it. You know, every kid wants to be a police, 12 years old, 13 years old. And then finally, when I graduated high school, I said, I'm going to go to school to be a police officer. So I studied administration of justice and guys when I tell you my entire life was planned out God was the furthest thing from my dream my desire I, I want to start by saying this I tell my wife to this day that I feel like any moment I'm gonna wake up from a dream I really feel this guys 11 years later my life is such a dream the way that God has saved me delivered me and how, and how I'm serving him I feel like I'm in a dream and I have this weird fear in the back of my head that one day I'm going to wake up from this dream and be back in the same addiction and bondage I was. But, but that's how incredible God is and what God does in our life. So I'm going through life. God is no, I have no thought of God. Um, I had a really crazy, as I grew up, I almost died so many times. I had family saying, you know, Isaiah must have a special call in his life because it was like the devil kept trying to kill me. I had a time where I hung myself at 12 years old. The testimonies on my channel, I accidentally hung myself, literally was hanging in a barn and an angel pulled me off the rope. I had another time where I got drugged under a tractor at 45 miles an hour down the road for about a mile, 100% should have been dead. An angel saved me again that time. I almost drowned as a child twice. I fell out of a car when I was little. I almost fell out of the car on a, on a highway. Another time, I had alcohol poisoning to the point where the doctors in the ER, I was in the emergency room, said you should be dead. We don't know how you're not dead. You're literally five times the limit your body should be able to handle. And then just months before I got saved, I was in a hotel at a party for a wedding and I was at the 13th floor and a voice kept telling me, just jump off the building, just jump off the building, just jump off the building. And then another voice was telling me, go back to bed, go back to bed. So there was this battle my whole life for for my life there was something trying to kill me something trying to destroy me i had over and over and over these near-death experiences but i know now today that i'm the interest of my grandparents prayers i'm the interest of my mom my dad's prayers i'm the result the interest i'm the result of my parents praying for me of my grandparents praying for me. I love my parents more than anything in this world. Um, they are incredible. They support the ministry. They're all in. But I just want you to know I had an incredible childhood. They raised me right. But that's not to say I didn't stray from God. And I want to encourage parents that are watching this. Maybe you have a, a, a child or a family member that's out in the world that you've been praying for. Don't stop praying because I was that one that was so far from God and God radically saved me. So I ended up just hard hearted. I ended up bitter. I was in a metal band. We had gone on tour. We had played shows. We were on stages. We had house shows. And I didn't really get into like drinking drugs, none of that. One, I didn't do drugs because I wanted to get a job as a law enforcement officer and you can't do drugs and do that. So I, I did start drinking maybe at the age of like 16 or 17. Right when I got out of my band, probably 17 is when I started wanting to do all the things that all my bandmates were doing. So I was a leader. So I didn't want to drink when everyone drank. But then whenever I got out of the band at 17, then I wanted to start drinking 
drinking, start partying. And so I got into that lifestyle. I live, you know, I was with a girl for four years. In the meantime, we'd break up for a week and I would go out with other people and do other things. And I was just living that life. I was angry. I was bitter. I was racist against my own race. That's how twisted the devil had me. I was hard hearted. I couldn't cry. I had an incredibly dirty mouth to the point where my friends in the world were like, dude, something's wrong with you. You talk so dirty, so demonic. Um, I mean, every other word was the F word. Isaiah Saldivar, yes. Every other word was the F word. I just had an incredibly dirty, dirty mouth. And I was just lost. I was 100% lost as it, as you can get with no, and I want you to keep this in mind, with no thought in a million years I would ever serve God or become a preacher or do anything. It was, it was the farthest thing that I ever had in my mind. And so I started watching these documentaries at the age of like 19, like documentaries about world wars and you know, we're running out of food and we're running out of water. And something started months before I ended up in church, something started changing in me. I started going to parties and thinking there has to be more to life. I'm watching these documentaries and I'm asking people, do you know about the water crisis? Do you know about the food crisis? Do you know about what's going on in the world right now? And there was like, God was like waking me up even before I got saved. And there was something stirring in me to look for answers. I was like, man, there has to be more. I don't believe in God. I don't believe God is real. God cares about me. I say I was atheist, but I was so confused. I don't even know if I was agnostic, atheist, or what. I don't know that an atheist is even a real term because everybody knows deep down there is a God. I think I just got so bitter that God never showed up in my life, that I never experienced his presence or power, that I kind of just got to a place where I was like, you're not real. And so that's when I say atheist, what I think I really mean by it is I was just like, God, you're not, you don't exist. You're not in my life. You want nothing to do with me. I want nothing to do with you. And so again, my whole life was planned. I had my 15 year plan. I was about to turn 20, start the academy. I was going through getting a job there and applying for the sheriff's department and kind of had the job on lock because my mom is a law enforcement officer. And so I was finishing college at the age of 20 and at 20 and a half, I was planning to, you know, go through the academy, do what you're supposed to do. And so my sister for about six months is bugging me to go to church. Isaiah, you got to go to church. Isaiah, you got to go to church. This church that I'm inviting you to, you're going to feel God. You're going to experience God. I thought she was crazy because I never understood that God could be felt. God could be experienced. I just thought God was some religious thing that you just pray to and does nothing. I thought, you know, when you're weak, you go to church, you know, to me, Christians, they dressed funny, they smelled weird, and I didn't really want nothing to do with God. And so I was just like, no, I don't want to go. So for about, I don't know, four, now I'll use some uh, vagueness as much as I can because I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to lie. So it was probably four to six months. I don't want to say an exact time, but it was probably four, between four and six months. My sister begged me, Isaiah, just go to church, go to church. And I'm like, there's no chance. There's no chance. Isaiah Saldivar is going to go to church. My mind was this. What do I need from God? What does God need from me? And why would I go to church? I have zero interest in praying to God, serving God, or doing anything like that with God. I just thought Christians were weird. I'm like, they're just weirdos and they just dress weird and they smell weird. I don't know. I just thought Christians were weirdos. So I thought I'm not going to go. And again, I'm reading all the comments. So it's right in front of my face here. So if you want to comment, ask questions, I'll let you as I go here. But so my sister begged me, I said, okay, we're going to go. So I invited my girlfriend. I said, listen, let's go to church just to shut my sister up. So if you're begging your family member to go to church and you're like, I've begged them for months, keep begging them, keep bugging them because I'm a result of my little sister bugging me to go to church. So I said, I'm going to go to church just to shut her up, just to get her off our back. But this is just one time, okay? I'm never going back again. So I end up at this church after months and months and months of my sister telling me, and I'll never forget this, guys. As I step foot in this church, I'm in Modesto, California. It's January 12th, 2011. It's, or, um, yeah, January 12th, 2011, I stepped foot in this church. It's a Wednesday night. And this, this thought crossed my mind as I stepped through the threshold of the church. And the thought was this, this will be the last time I ever step foot in a church. Now, was that a demon speaking to me? I don't know. I know I had demons. I don't know if that was a demon. I don't know if that was my own thought, but it was probably a demon, a thought crossing. This will be the last time that I ever step foot in a church. So that's the mindset that I have going into this church. So we go to this church and seats, I don't know, maybe 2000 people maybe 3,000. I sit in the very back. I really don't want nothing to do with God. I'm making to my friend next to me sexual jokes about the worship leader who is, I didn't know, was the pastor's wife. And so I'm making sexual jokes about the people doing worship on stage. That's how far I was and how distant I was from God. So my friend's on my right, my girlfriend's on my left, and I'm kind of sitting there, not interested. A, a man named Jason Nettles, who's a good friend of mine now, is preaching this message about world missions. And I'm like, you know, doesn't really have nothing to do with me, but he's talking about 
it's time to change the world. God's called you. And one statement that really stood out to me, he said, do you want to be this year doing what you did every other year? And I thought about the last few years of the same parties, the same drinking, the same people, the same everything. And my life was just on this treadmill. And I thought maybe he's right. Maybe there is some change or something that I should do to change my life, not thinking it was God. So the message is over. And all of a sudden I'm sitting in the back thinking I want nothing to do with God. And I felt something pulling on my shirt. Now, when I say I felt something pulling on my shirt, I'm not talking about in the sense of like, oh, I felt something drawing me. I'm talking about, I literally felt as if somebody grabbed my shirt and was pulling me to the altar. I, all I could say was this, it was a force drawing me to the altar. Now, I didn't know the Bible says nobody comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. But in a tangible sense, I felt something dragging me to that altar. Literally, like I, ha- I couldn't resist it. So. I got out of my chair, I went to that altar, and again, if I get emotional, I'm not, who am I apologizing to? I don't know, but I may get emotional tonight, but it's just so real, guys. 11 years later, it's so real, and I got out of my chair, I went to that altar, and I said, God, I don't, I don't effing believe in you. I, I was bitter. Again, I was hard-hearted. I hadn't cried in over 10 years at this point, and I just really didn't think God was real. I just thought, I'm going to get up here and give it a shot. Give it a try. I feel something drawing me. I feel something pulling me, and so I start saying what I know to say. God, you're not real. Kind of just giving God my grievances, and then I started saying the craziest statements I could make, like the bet, like betting God, basically, and I, I was really into gambling at the time, but I thought, you know, I'm going to just say, if you're real God, I don't believe you're real, but if you are, and I remember saying, you know, I'll move out of state, I'll break up with my girlfriend, I'll leave the job at law enforcement, I'll travel the world. I don't even know why I was saying this. I was just like, I'll do anything. I didn't think God was real, that I was so willing to just lay it all out and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do if you're real, because I just didn't think God was real. So I thought, I'm talking to nobody, I'm talking to air. And then I was like, you know, I'm not praying the sinner's prayer, because I prayed that my entire life growing up as a teenager, nothing ever happened. I would literally go party, drink, and then, oh, pray the sinner's prayer. It was just like, it was just fake to me. So I said, I'm not doing that, but if you are real, and if you show yourself to me, I'll give everything to you. I'll literally, again, talking to a God that I'm convinced is not real. I'll give everything to you. I'll lay it all down. And in that moment, it wasn't a still small voice. It wasn't an inward voice. It wasn't like, you know, somebody prayed over me. I hear all of a sudden, here I am an atheist. Again, I want to put quotes on that because I don't even think I was really an atheist. But here I am a self-proclaimed atheist. God's not real. Leave me alone. I'm never coming to church again. And here I am now, the audible voice of God speaks to me. Again, not inward, an audible voice from, from the sky speaks to me and says Isaiah, says my name. Now, For the God of the universe, 7 billion people, and then all of a sudden you're hearing an audible voice, just put yourself in my shoes, an audible voice say, Isaiah, everything changes at that moment. Everything changes that point when you feel God speak to you. And I heard the the, the, the Lord, the God of the universe say, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% of you. I want everything. I want all of you. Basically, God began to tell me, I'm not interested in halfway, half out. And now God knew, obviously, I'm super, super radical. I'm all in about everything. If you can't hear the broadcast, refresh it. Someone type refresh the broadcast in the chat because there's people saying they can't hear. But I'm all in with everything. And so God knew I need to either be all in or be all out. So he's like, I want everything from you. And I'm now at this point, I'm hearing the audible voice of God. I instantly start crying. Mind you, I hadn't cried in 10 years. So I'm instantly crying like a baby. At this point, my girlfriend had been standing next to me at the altar. I'm bawling like a baby as the, as God himself is speaking to me. And then something that probably many of you won't believe started happening to me. Dirt started coming out of my eyes. Now, when I say dirt, I'm not talking about, oh, spiritual dirt with scales. I'm talking about literal dirt started coming out of my eyes. And I remember rubbing my eyes, rubbing my eyes, rubbing my eyes and like looking at my hands and seeing like dirt in my hands. And I'm rubbing this dirt out of my eyes and I'm going, I'm hearing the voice of God, I'm crying. And then I end up at, I don't know where it was, but some say, were you in heaven? Were you in a vision? I don't know. I just know that I was in a place with bright, bright light and a bright light was in front of me and everything was bright and I was hearing God say, you know, I have this plan for you. I saw a vision of me standing on a stage preaching to thousands of people. I actually had a vision of North Korea. That was my first vision ever. I saw North Korea getting liberated. I saw myself preaching in North Korea, preaching the gospel. I saw all these visions happen. And again, it was this radical encounter where God's speaking to me and I'm speaking back to God 
and I'm thinking, okay, God is telling me, I'm going to use you to preach. I want all of you. Uh, I want you to lay it all down. Dirt's coming out of my eyes. I'm in this vision now in this place that's a bright light. Everything's bright around me. I'm in front of this bright light speaking to me. And I just respond with like, I don't have no- nothing to give you. Like you're coming to me asking me to serve you when I'm an atheist. I have nothing to offer you. And I and I heard God saying, I'll take your hands. I'll take your feet. I'll take your mouth. Like God saying, I'm going to use you. Like, I don't want anything from you, Isaiah. I want you. You're the sacrifice. You're the offering. And I think when we come to God, we think God needs us. When God says, I don't need your abilities, I need your availability. I need your body parts. And so I just said, God, yeah, whatever you want me to do. And then I respond with, I don't know how to pray. You know, you want me to do all this? I don't know anybody famous. I don't know how to pray. And God said, I'll teach you to pray. And as God's speaking to me, I'm having this encounter. I somewhat came out of this encounter. And as I come out of this encounter, I'm speaking in a language that I don't know. I'm like speaking in, now I know it was tongues, but at the time I didn't know what it was. In my entire life, I had heard tongues one time as a little child, I was probably six or seven years old. I have a vivid memory of my parents speaking in tongues in our living room praying. That was the one time in my entire life I ever heard about tongues. And here I am speaking uncontrollably in tongues, crying uncontrollably. I'm covering my mouth because my girlfriend's next to me and I'm like, I don't want her to speak. I don't want her to hear me and I don't even know what I'm saying. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't control it. I mean, really, I was just having this born again experience. And then God says, pray an hour. And then the pastor on stage says, literally gets up and says, and there's 500 young people at the altar, mind you. And the pastor says, there's a young man right now. And God says, I'm removing the dirty scales off your eyes. And God says to you, young man, that all he wants you to do is commit an hour. Who in this room will commit one hour of prayer a day? And that was what God told me. God said, I want you, Isaiah, to pray one hour a day. And then here, five minutes later, the pastor's on stage saying, God is saying to pray one hour a day. So I have this encounter my hands are up. I'm shaking. I'm crying. I'm speaking in tongues. Again, people say, oh, tongues is demonic. Tongues is this. I'm like, yeah, right, dude. I didn't even know what it was. And I was speaking in tongues. So I come out of this vision and all I could explain it to you guys. Again, I'm going to read some out of my journal. So you're going to hear some raw stuff about my first encounter and, and what it was like. And some of it for me is cringe, but it's real. It's raw. All I can say, guys, is I didn't recognize anybody. I didn't recognize anything. I didn't recognize anyone again, I get emotional talking about, but it was, it was, it was, I was born again. I was a new person. The old Isaiah didn't exist anymore. He was completely wiped off the face of the earth. It was a funeral that night for Isaiah and it was a birth for the new man. And I was, I was frantic because I, I didn't recognize anybody. And when I say they recognize anybody, I really do mean that. And so I was kind of like, they turned the lights on and I'm kind of like panicking what is going on. And you know, the people that came with me, like my girlfriend looked different. My friend looked different. Everybody looked different. I just didn't recognize the blue on the walls. Didn't look like blue. The greens didn't look like green. And my sister said, Hey, are you okay? Um, what, what's going on with you? I was like, I don't know. I just know I need to get home. I don't know what's going on with me. And so she ends up, we end up going home and for the next several days and then days even after that, which I'll share in my journal, I didn't sleep. I was up day and night. I was having dreams. I was having visions. I was seeing myself preach. I was hearing God say there's going to be revival. God was sharing with me scriptures I've never even read before. And God began to show me that there was going to be a revival in my family, that my family was all going to get saved, which they did. And I'll share their testimonies as well. My friends were going to get saved, which they did. Um, there was going to be thousands of people coming to my living room. And there was going to be this revival movement that God was going to use me to to preach all over the world to millions and millions of people. And I want to say, guys, tonight, the fact that there's 3,000 of you watching and, you know, we're reaching 3 million people now a week, this is an answer to a word God gave me 11 years ago. Like, I'm walking in barely right now, 11 years of preaching, traveling, doing everything. I'm now walking in the word God gave me in 2011. So here I am. I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating. And guys, I was at a place where I literally thought I was never going to eat. My mom would say, Isaiah, you got to eat something. And I'd be like, I don't need food. I would be like, my food is doing the will of my father. I'm never eating again. I mean, I was so radical. I literally thought I was never going to eat food again. And after about two weeks, I finally ate. I lost about 25 pounds. I think I weighed like 145, 150. I was working out every day. I was taking weight gainer. I think I weighed 145 when I got saved and I was down to like 120, 115. I mean, I was super skinny. I'm skinny now, but I was even skinnier. I was just so consumed with God. 
One thing I don't know if I've ever shared is for the first week or two, I struggled to read the Bible. I would literally open up the Bible and I would start shaking and crying and I would shut it and I would be like, it's alive. It's alive. I can't read it. It's alive. It would, I would so have like a panic attack reading because it was so real to me. It was so alive to me. And I lived 19 years, this lie. And now all of a sudden I'm awake, didn't recognize nothing. I go to college the next day after not sleeping. I'm seeing demons and angels all over my college campus. So mind you, I go from being this atheist to the next day, I remember driving to college on the freeway. I pulled over on the freeway and I'm on the side of the freeway bawling like a baby. Remember, I didn't cry before. I'm bawling like a baby. I'm looking at the stars. I mean, I'm looking at the sun. I'm looking at the sky. I'm looking, I'm like, it's a butterfly flying by and I'm crying at everything because again, I'm new. I'm a new person. I, it's like, I've never seen the sun before. I have the grass. And if you've been born again, you know what I mean? It's like the grass is greener. You go from like standard definition, 480p to 4k, everything becomes alive. And I'm on the side of the road going, why am I crying? And I'm at college. I'm seeing demons and angels. And I remember sitting in my college class and I'm hearing the thoughts of the guy next to me. I'm getting a word of knowledge. Now, I didn't know about word of knowledge. I didn't know about prophecy. So I literally thought I'm sitting in college the next day and I'm getting a word of knowledge for the guy next to me about his life and his dad and some abuse he went through. And I'm like, I think I woke up a psychic. I think the devil entered me because I didn't know what word of knowledge or prophecy was. So I just thought, you know, maybe I'm a psychic. I don't know what's going on. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting thoughts and I'm seeing things and I'm having these spiritual encounters. And I am in college the first day ever I left college early because I was a total teacher's pet. I sat front row straight A's. I left college. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm in my car going, I don't know what's going on. I get home. My family doesn't know what to do with me. Everyone's like, what is going on with Isaiah? Something's happening with him. Well, at the time I had, and I'm telling everybody, you know, God is coming back tomorrow. God is real. I'm getting words of knowledge from my family telling them this happened to you. I had no filter. I mean, they were literally scared to take me out in public because I was prophesying. I would walk up to random people and be like, at four years old, this happened to you. God wants to heal you. I'd be in the middle of Save Mart. And they're like, what? You can't say that, Isaiah. I'm prophesying over our animals. I'm not kidding, guys. I was so radical, so sold out. I went home, deleted 40,000 songs off my iTunes, broke all my video games, broke all my music. I was just going all out because I knew God had done something in me and I didn't want to lose what God was doing. And so my uncle who had been in ministry my uncle Nino plays a huge part in my whole story. I literally wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. He was uh, in ministry for 30 years. He was doing a conference in New York. And so everybody was calling him. I sent him about a hundred text messages the night I got saved. I was like, God is real. God is alive. Cause before I went to church, he was leaving in New York. And I told him, I'm just going to go to church to see how it is to check it out. My sister won't stop bugging me. She, he's like, let me know how it goes. Well, I'm blowing up his phone. God is real. You don't understand. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. We're an end time army. And he's like, what is going on? And all my family's calling him. We don't know what happened to Isaiah. Something happened to Isaiah. He's not the same. He won't sleep. He won't eat. He's talking about end times, revival, last days, fivefold ministry, all these things. So they call him. They're like, you need to get, you need to get home. There's something going on with Isaiah. And he's like, I'll be home soon. They're like, no, you need to get home now. Something happened to Isaiah. And so when he gets home, guys, I'm day after day after day talking for 12 hours straight, 14 hours. They had to baby, they had to take shifts to watch me. I'm not kidding. My mom, my dad, my uncle, my sister, they would take turns watching me because I would just talk for 12 to 14 hours. And there's something I used to do. Some of the stuff I'm going to share is cringe guys, but it's remember I just gotten saved, but I used to always do this thing where when I would talk, I would put my hand like this. I would be like, God is coming back. God is real. God is moving in our family. And they would be like, why are you doing that with my hand, your hand? And I would always say, whenever I use my hand like this, God is speaking through me. And the funny part is now I always go like this when I preach. And so it's like, I almost still do that, but I used to always go like this, you know, God is coming and I would, And they would say, why are you doing that with your hand? And I would like, whenever I do this, God is speaking out of me. But it was again, you have to remember, I went from being an atheist to now I'm radically not sleeping, not eating. God is telling me revival is going to happen. And so all my friends I was partying with, drinking with, word got around, something happened to Isaiah. And I was throwing these parties. I was going to these parties. And so now my friends that were my party friends were like, well, dude, where's the party at? 
and I would be like, come over my house. And so they would end up coming over. We'd end up praying and they would be getting manifesting. They would be getting delivered. Demons were going to be getting cast out. And so my uncle ended up coming home. He said, okay, Isaiah, what's going on? Everyone's calling me, freaking out. You're not sleeping. You're not eating. We don't know what to do. What is God saying? And I told him, God said, there's going to be a revival in our living room. Hundreds and thousands of people are going to come and get saved, delivered. My family's going to get saved. My friends are going to get saved. Everybody's going to get saved. This is what God is showing me. And he said, well, what, do, what is God saying to do? I said, God is saying to pray. So we started, and I, I kid you not, 24 hours a day prayer meeting. We didn't have prayer meetings for an hour. Our prayer meeting went day in and day out, day in and day out. And here's why. Because we were partying before all day. We didn't just party on Sunday. So we were just these young kids thinking, well, we used to party 24 seven and go out and do whatever and act stupid. Well, now we're going to pray. So imagine at my house, 24 hours a day, there's a prayer meeting going on where people are coming, fam family are praying, friends are praying. I'm sharing my testimony with everybody. My old friends are getting delivered. They're getting saved. And God said, Isaiah, I'm going to visit your house. I'm really going to visit your house. And let me just say this, guys, the stuff that I did, I'll go on a limb to say, I believe the reason why God moved is because I did things and we as a family did things that people are not willing to do. You might say, well, this is legalistic legalism, brother, but this was radical obedience. So um, several days later, the Holy Spirit said, Isaiah, I want to move in your home, but I can't dwell where there's anything unholy. So while my parents were at work, I kid you not, I moved all the furniture out of my house. I moved all the TVs out of my house. I started getting rid of everybody's movies, everybody's music. I didn't give them a choice. And my brother, who was not saved at the time, was my party friend, my best friend. He was so mad that I got saved, and I'll share his testimony in a bit here. He said, Isaiah, I'm going to go to hell just to prove to you that God doesn't save anybody, everybody. So my, my best friend, my older brother, who now works for our ministry full time and has been in ministry ever since said, Isaiah, I'm going to go to hell just to prove to you that God is not real and that God cannot save me. And I knew God said, I'm going to, I'm going to save your brother. So I wasn't even worried about it, but he would be drinking high. We'd be praying at the house. He'd come in mad. He would go to his room and he would shove a towel under his door crack because he said something would come into his room while we were having prayer meetings. So he thought if he put a towel under his door, nothing could get under his door into his room, not realizing the Holy Spirit can't be stopped by a towel. But that's what was happening to him. He was experiencing the Holy Spirit, but he didn't know what it was and he was hiding in his room. And we were, again, I moved all the furniture and my mom's like, what are you doing? And I was like, mom, there's gonna be hundreds of people coming and you know, your plant has to move because that's three souls and the chairs, the couch. I literally destroyed my parents' house. I was like, everything has to go. Well, mind you, this was the answer to my parents' prayers. They had prayed for me to be saved. They'd prayed for me my whole life. And my mom was just like, Lord, save him. And so now that I was like, you know, and God said, you're not going to do law enforcement. I knew immediately I wasn't going to do law enforcement. God had removed that desire. Now God is telling me you're going to have revival. This was the answer to my parents' prayer. But at the other way, they were like, this dude is crazy. We've never seen anything like this. He's lost it. And so we moved everything out. And one night I was praying and I just want to show you how crazy I was. Okay. In, in the best way possible. But one night I'm praying and the Holy Spirit said, there's still two items. And again, you might say legalism, say whatever you want. This is my testimony. The Holy Spirit said, there's two items in your house that you need to get rid of before my Holy Spirit begins to move in your home. And there's a revival. You need to consecrate your house. He said, there is a bottle of tequila in your little sister's room, in her closet, wrapped up in the top of her closet. No one knows it's there. And your brother hid a stack of Harry Potter Blu-ray DVDs or Blu-ray movies in the bottom of his dirty hamper. Now, mind you, everybody was hiding stuff because they knew Isaiah the tornado was going to show up and get rid of all of our stuff. So my brother had hid brand new Harry Potter Blu-ray DVDs because I was in his room getting rid of his stuff. I, no one had a choice. I was just getting rid of everything because, again, God said the Holy Spirit's going to show up and move in revival. So I go into my sister's room. I open the door one night and I'm like, looking around. She's like, what do you want? And again, everyone's scared of me at this point. I'm like, God is showing me there's something in here. I said, there's a bottle of alcohol in your closet that God says we have to get rid of if he's going to show up. My sister turns white as a ghost. She's watching this. She knows this is true. Turns white as a ghost and says, how did you know that? And I said, the Holy Spirit told me we got to get rid of this so that he could have, we could have revival. So we go in there. She pulls out this bottle of tequila. And again, my sister didn't drink none of that. She's the one that invited me to church, but her boss at the Mexican restaurant she worked at gave her this bottle of tequila and it was very expensive. So she said, I didn't know what to do with it. So I wrapped it up and I stuck it up in my closet and I just hid it because I didn't know what to do. And so I got it. We poured it out. 
So the next was my brother who wasn't saved, right? So I go in his room and he's like, what do you want, you Jesus freak? Get out of here. And I was like, um, there's something in here. And I looked around and I go into his dirty hamper. Mind you, this is a, a single college age guy. Dirty hamper just does not smell the best. And I start digging, throwing out all of his dirty clothes, his dirty boxers, his dirty socks. And I'm like, I know it's in here. And he's like, get out, you freak. What do you want? We're, go we're fighting back and forth. I grab this brand new, you know, box set of back then again, 2011 Blu-ray just had been the big thing. Blu-ray Harry Potter. I grab it. I run out the room. I slam the door. He's chasing me outside. He's chasing me out. And I'm like, no. So what I, what I did was I put everything in the garage because we had a detached garage. And I, in my mind, I was like, okay, the Holy Spirit wants to move. And so if I put all this stuff in the detached garage, he can move in the house, right? Because it's different. So I put it, all his stuff, all my sister, like anything I could find, shoved it in the garage. And we just begin to pray and we begin to pray and God begin to move. And I'll never forget the first night we said, we're gonna pray with some family. I wanna say like 25 people showed up and we didn't even know who most of these people were. They just said, oh, we just heard that some guy got encountered God in Manteca and there was a prayer meeting going on. Again, we had no Facebook, no advertisement. I didn't make my YouTube channel until I think October of 2011. So there was no advertisement. People were just hearing there was a revival on Castle Road and something's happening and so, I remember the first night ever, this girl brought her mom who was a prostitute. And again, I was just an atheist a few days ago, so I don't know what I'm doing. And we start having this prayer meeting and this is my first deliverance ever, guys. It's cringe, but it's real. And this lady starts manifesting, starts, and she's manifesting a demon. She ends up laid out on her back. I didn't know really what to do deliverance. I just knew that it was in the Bible. And so I, I kid you not, this is a true story. I got on top of this lady. And again, I don't recommend anybody do this. I got on top of this lady, like on top of her as you know, on my knees, on top of her, she's on her back. And I'm literally looking, looking at her face to face. And I'm like, you demon come out. And her mouth is super wide open. This is so cringe. I know, but it's so raw. Her mouth was like wide open. Cause this demon screaming out of her. And I'm like, I'm looking down her mouth and I'm like, I see you. I know you're in there. I know you're in there. Come out. I can see you. Like, I just don't even know what I'm doing. I just know the Bible says this and we can do this. And so I'm like choking her because I thought, you know, you literally have to get the demon out. So I'm literally choking her. And then, you know, my family's like, no, that's not how you do it. And I'm like, come out. And we're screaming. I'm like pushing on her stomach again. Do not recommend any of this. I was just saying, I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm literally screaming like, you know, it's like the planet of the apes where they're like, is there a soul in there? I'm literally like, I know there's a demon in there. And so we're having this crazy yelling battle and it ends up the Holy Ghost is like, that's not how you do it, Isaiah. And then the Holy Spirit led us through and we ended up casting the demon out of this lady. And that's for me where I think my eyes were so open to the fact that this is real. This is not a game. This is not a joke. There's a real spiritual realm. And so word got out, you know, this lady had a demon cast out of her, you know, this guy was on top of her screaming. And so my old friends that I was partying with are like, dude, what is going on? They would literally come through my door. And as they'd step foot through my door, they would start manifesting demons. People were getting healed. People were getting out of wheelchairs. My aunt who was born deaf in, in one ear, she had no inner eardrum. My grandma had German measles. So when my aunt was born, she had no eardrum. And several weeks after getting saved, we were at a conference with her. And the guy at the conference said, hey, these young people just got saved because he heard about us. Everyone go pray. And so my aunt had had every man of God you can think of pray for her. Mario Merlo, Morcerello, Benny Hinn, and she had never obviously got healed. And she is a, a nurse, you know, very high up in the medical world. Her friends are doctors, nurses, and one of her ears had no eardrum. So it wasn't like she was just deaf a little. She had literally nothing in there. And we laid hands on her and began to pray for her. She ended up getting her hearing back. And so God began to do these miracles that were so huge to us that word began to spread and we went from you know just a few people to 30 to 50 to 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 to at the end of the revival at the house when we finally moved into a building we were like four to five hundred people every single week and i'm going to show you videos tonight towards the end of me preaching in my living room and you'll see what it was like but i kid you not i would sit in the corner of my living room people would be sitting on my feet I kid you not i'm going to show you a video of this people would be sitting on my feet and i'd be standing like this preaching all I knew to preach and right and I listen back and it's like it's so weird to me but it was so real what God was doing again wasn't sleeping just powerful God moving my brother ends up um, I'll share with you how he got saved he ends up coming in one night he's always drunk always high he told me you know I'm gonna go to hell just to prove you wrong and so one night I had the idea to challenge him I thought you know this guy was like 
no everyone would never turn down a challenge could always you know anytime someone said you could you I, get, I bet you'll only take one pill he would take three pills anytime someone said jump off the roof he'd jump off the second story like he just always would take the challenge and so one day we were praying i'm i'm saved i don't know a few weeks probably at this point he walks in he's high he's drunk he said you know blah blah, blah. and i stop him i said nico you've tried everything but god i said try god and if God doesn't show up right now, we're going to pray. And if God doesn't show up right now and change you, I said, I will never ask you to, to go to church again. I will never ask you for prayer again. Just give God a try. You've tried everything else in your life. Try God. He said, fine, whatever. I was like, I, I dare you. I challenge you. So I said, pray with me. Now, I didn't know what to pray. I just knew that I prayed a prayer. Remember my prayer? God, if you're real, I'll lay down this, I'll do this. And so I said, Nico, I prayed this prayer where I basically just went all out saying, God, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I put everything out on the table. I went all in. I said, just try that. Try praying that. So, you know, it was the only prayer I knew to pray that worked. And so he prayed, you know, if you're real, God, I'll give you everything. I'll serve you. I'll do this. I'll do that. And uh, I'll lay it all down. And so we get done praying. I'll never forget this moment. I look up and I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting for him to have the, God moment where God says, Nico, I have a plan and I'm waiting for this. And I look at him, I go, so did you feel anything? Did you hear anything? I mean, I'm, I'm all in at this point. And he goes, nope, nothing. I'm like, you didn't even feel like a warmth. He's like, nope. I'm like, you didn't even feel nope. And so he walks away going, I guess God's not real. And I thought, you know, I made him a bet. I said, I would never talk to him about God. I'll never witness again. And I guess God, you know, isn't going to save him. I don't know. So I went back to prayer. Kid you not. And again, I'm going to be raw about this. If you get offended, oh well. The next day, I'm, I don't remember what I was doing. I was doing something in my living room, probably praying because we did that 24-7. And I get a call from Nico. He's at work. He's worked at Starbucks. I worked at a different Starbucks. And he goes, this is the first thing Nico says on the phone. He goes, dude, what'd you do to me? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, this is the exact words he said. He said, I woke up gay. I was like, what? He's like, dude, I woke up gay. He said, I woke up and I got to work and I tried checking out my girlfriend and I couldn't even check her out. He goes, I, I can't lust after her. I can't lust. I've been trying to check out customers. I can't lust after them. He goes, and he used to smoke literally multiple packs a day. He goes, I tried to go smoke out a cigarette and I spit it out. I threw away my pack. I don't, you know, and he, again, he used to drink a handle of vodka a day. I can't count how many times I dragged his lifeless body through our house. He goes, dude, I can't, I have no desire to do drink, to smoke. I can't check out women. Like, what'd you do to me? What happened to me? I'm like, dude, you're not gay. I'm like, you're born again. I said, Nico, for so long, we chased women and we looked at women like a piece of meat. And so now that you're saved, you're looking at women with value. You're looking at women with respect. You know, he just thought that he, he was just gay. He's like, I don't know what to do, but he really was born again. And I'm telling you right now, man, Again, I get emotional talking about this. From that moment on, he got ended up getting delivered right after that. I was at work. My family did a deliverance on him. He's been serving God 11 years. He was going and planning a drug house. He was selling drugs. He was doing drugs. He was like, he was the guy that you would think this guy would never get saved. I mean, just trouble his entire life caused trouble. And 11 years later, he has multiple Christian hip hop albums. He ran a Christian clothing line. He traveled with me for years. He works for the ministry full time. He's serving God. Um, it was just radical. My little sister, and I'll share that with you after ends up you know being on fire for god my older sister she was actually away at college when all this happened and i'll never forget uh it was like maybe i don't know how many few months after me getting saved that my sister came home from college santa barbara she came home from college and walked in my house looked at me and i started talking and she started crying she ran out of my house my uncle who was pastoring me, discipling me, helping me, Nino, was across the street. She ran into Nino's house, said, Nino, what happened to my brother? There's a guy over at my house. I don't know who that is. And my uncle said, that's your brother. And she said, no, it's not. I don't know what happened to him. He looks different. He talks different. He acts different. And my uncle said, that's the, the old Isaiah that you used to know. That's not the real Isaiah. The Isaiah at your house, that's the Isaiah that God created him to be. She literally, was, I was so born again, my older sister didn't even recognize me. So she comes home, she's crying. She's like, what are you doing? I don't want to talk to you. And God began to give me words of knowledge like he often was doing to just prove himself, to see people get saved. It was just crazy. And I said, Sunshine, you drove five hours from Santa Barbara to Manteca, I said, and God has given me a word of knowledge. Um, just to show you God is real, I'm gonna tell you the conversations you had for five hours, 
I'm going to tell you who was in the car. I'm going to tell you what you guys talked about. And for the next four hours, I literally went into detail with my sister of every person in the car, what they talked about, who they were. And I, I literally gave her a download of the last three or four months of her life. I said, this is what you've been doing. This is what you've been going through. And not me, but God was speaking through me, giving her these words of knowledge. And then I said this, because she didn't you know, believe God was real, all that like me. I said, just to prove to you God is real, tomorrow night we're gonna go to a conference and I said, I'm gonna tell you the sermon title and the illustration and what the preacher is gonna be preaching tomorrow night at the conference. I said, and whenever, as I drop my journal, I said, and whenever that preacher gets up and preaches what I'm about to tell you he's gonna preach, then will you serve God? Then will you know God is real? She said, if that happens, I'll, I'll believe, okay? I'll, I'll think it's real. So Banning Liebscher, who at the time was pastoring Jesus Culture, I think he still is, was preaching the next day at a conference. And so we went to that conference and I told my sister, I said, he's going to preach about going all in. I said, he's going to talk about and use an illustration about diving off a cliff. And he's going to say, you know, we have to go all in. If you don't go all in and you're cliff diving and you're sitting there not stepping over, then that's not like, you're going to have no fun. Like nobody goes cliff diving, stands at the edge and goes, this is so fun. The fun starts when you step off the point of no return. So I gave her that illustration. God told me this is what he's going to preach about. I said, he's going to talk about this. He's going to talk about going all in. And I gave him all that. So never forget this. The next day we're sitting at the conference and he gets up to preach. And in my mind, I'm like, Lord, I know you spoke to me. I know you gave me this word of knowledge. Please let him preach on what you told me he was going to preach on. And so my sister could be saved. And I'm sitting there and I'll never forget this. He says, today, I want to talk about going to the, going all in past the point of no return. And then he starts saying, I was in Reading a few weeks ago and we were, we were uh, dive, we were cliff diving off of rocks into the water. And I kid you guys not, he used the exact illustration that I told my sister he was going to use of jumping past the point of no return and going all in. And I remember the moment he started sharing that illustration of, you know, going all in cliff diving, I look over at my sister's bawling her eyes out. That night she got saved. That night she was born again. I share these testimonies with you guys to show you the radicalness of the beginning of my salvation, of how God was saving my cousins, my uncles, my aunts. Like literally everybody in my family got saved. Everybody around me got saved. I remember you know, even, even right after being saved, I would share my faith. I'd be at school and I would start manifesting. I realized like, man, there's a demon on the inside of me. And so several days after getting saved, my little sister did a deliverance on me. I tried delivering myself in my college parking lot. I was screaming in my college car. I got home. I told my little sister, there's something in me trying to come out of me. I think it's a demon. And my little sister literally cast demons out of me in my living room just days after getting saved. I think for me, what really hit me, um, that really like struck me that I was all in for God and God had changed my friends, changed my family, started revival was when one day one of my best party friends that had done, you know, party with me. This guy was always doing drugs. This guy was always partying. We were literally praying for eight hours straight. Think about this. And I'm sitting there and that we're only saved a few weeks. I'm praying. We're like eight hours into this, into prayer. And I'm bawling my eyes out because we're praying for the ending of abortion, right? That's what we were praying for in the prayer meeting. And I'll never forget this moment. And I feel it even right now. I look over at my friend who was my party friend. We prayed eight hours, you know, we were drinking all every day. We, he was doing drugs. He was the guy that would never get saved. I look over at my buddy, Logan at the time. And I see this guy bawling his eyes out, praying for the ending of abortion. And it hit me. We were two weeks ago, partying at a beer pong tournament, drinking, doing all that stuff. Two weeks later, we're crying eight hours in crying for the ending of abortion. And I realized how powerful God is, how real God is. And that was the moment I really realized revival is happening. So that went on for in my living room, which I'm going to show you clips here in a minute. I'm going to open my journal here in a minute. That went on for about 10 months, 11 months. Then we moved into a building. They said, oh, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll grow into it. it. Seats 500 people. The first night in our first building, there were people outside couldn't get in. And this revival went on for almost 10 years, the Awakening 209. Every single week, miracles, revival. My my uncle, who's my pastor still this day, traveled with me for 10 years. Um, Rick Joyner found out about it, and I'll show you a clip of how, but he found out about it because Amber Brooks was came to our house, and I got invited to speak with him, Reinhard Bonnke, Bob Jones. Mind you, I'm barely saved, guys. I don't even know the names of the 12 disciples. I'm saved like 10 months. And he invites me to speak with Reinhard Bonnke, Bob Jones, and Rick Joyner on a massive stage. You know, millions of people watching on God TV, a building that's like seats 3,000. That was my first time ever being on a plane traveling. And from that moment, preaching the main night, 
here's this guy. Who is he? We don't know. But here he is. He has a house revival. He's preaching with Reinhard Bonnke the night after Reinhard Bonnke on God TV. And for me, that was the moment things really took off and my traveling ministry started, the word got out. And when things started going crazy, that was, that was the end of um, 2011, 2012. I traveled there for the next few years and preached. And then God just kind of opened up. But I remember even like one time I was at my job, I was so radically saved. And when you get radically saved, you all think like the world's ending tomorrow. And I remember being at Starbucks I was praying for people in the drive-thru. Literally everyone at my job pretty much got saved. I was laying hands. We were seeing demons cast out. We were preaching at Starbucks and we literally took over that Starbucks. And I remember one day thinking, I'm going to quit my job. I even called my mom. I said, mom, I'm quitting my job because God is telling me to put a potato sack on. I literally had an image of myself wearing a John the Baptist potato sack. And then I was like, I don't even know where to buy a potato sack. But I thought I thought I was going to wear this potato sack and go on the corner of Main Street in Yosemite by Walmart and preach that end was coming. But it was really that radical um, salvation, just crazy over and over again, just all these things happening. Um, I would say too, you know, just for months I, I'll, I'll share this as well people say well how'd you learn to preach i never learned to preach for months i would go to bed and i would wake up in my body at night standing up preaching full-on sermons for months this went on my mom would say oh i heard you preaching again last night i would literally wake up into my body preaching for i don't know three or four months i would never wake up in my bed i would wake up either on my knees on the corner of the room on my back on my side because literally every night i would wake up in the middle of the night and i'd be preaching full messages and what god showed me was I was teaching you to preach. The Holy Spirit was literally teaching me how to preach in the middle of the night. I was just totally learning to preach through the Holy Spirit. And so this is what happened. It was radical. Again, I'm, I'm all that I'm living now is fruit of that. Even me and my wife getting married, my wife got saved like a month or two after me. She came, her friend said, oh, there's a bunch of these guys at this house. Let's just go. And so they came, she thought I was crazy. And then she wanted to come back the next week. And so her friend was coming because her friend was like, oh, there's a bunch of hot guys at this house. That's why her friend was coming. But my wife ended up having an encounter with God about a year later after her encounter. I was in Bible college. She was in Bible college with me. This is a year later. And the pastor said, go find a place to uh, hear God. Don't get up till you hear God. So I went to the corner of the room. I lay down. And I heard God speak as clear as possible. Alyssa is your wife. Alyssa is going to be your wife. And I was so bad with girls before I told God, the first person I get feelings for, that's the person I want to marry. I'm not going to you know, test drive. I'm not going to date other people. None of that. The first person I get feelings for, I'm going to marry. So literally, I can honestly say right now, my wife was the first girl that I ever had feelings for after getting saved. We, in front of 650, 700 people, we didn't ever date. We didn't go through like, oh, we're going to date for six months and try it out. We literally didn't date. God spoke to me. God spoke to her. We fasted. We prayed with our pastors, our leaders. I stood up before our church. Nobody knew anything because we didn't date. And I proposed to my wife right there on the stage. And two and a half months later, we got married. So we never dated, guys. We got engaged and got married. And we're going to celebrate 10 years this year. So this is the level of what God was doing, the radicalness of, I could share more about deliverances, about miracles. But I know what you guys want to hear. You guys want me to read from my journal and then I'll show you some footage from the house. Again, guys, I want to remind you this is raw. To me, it's cringy, but it's not because it was my early days of salvation. But let me read some of this. I'm going to show you this has been opened two or three times in 10, 11 years. Okay. I've read through this one time in 11 years. Today was the second time I looked through this. Some of the names I'm going to skip over because I don't want to expose anybody, but I'm going to read you some of the stuff I wrote. I got this the day after. And then later on, I ended up getting it inscribed with my name and all that. But yeah, there's dust on this. I pulled it out of a box today. This is the, <laughs> this is the arc that's never been opened before. Right. Um, so we're going to read through some of it. I'll see how long you guys want me to read. Cause there's a lot in here, but I just want to read you some of the stuff that I was thinking. And the fact that you guys are an answer to a lot of this prophecy and what I'm living today is a result of this. Again, I wrote in this journal the day after I got saved. So right here I have uh, January 12th. So this must've been I don't know. It's January 12th. So it must've been the next day. I got saved the night of the 12th, 2011, but here I have. Okay. Again, I feel emotional already. Oh, give me a second here, guys. It, it wasn't emotional earlier, but it's, it's emotional when I read it to you guys. All right. Cause it's so real to me. 11 years later, again, I feel like I'm going to dream. I'm, I'm going to wake up from any time, but let me just share this with you guys. I know we're already 47 minutes in. All right. This is titled January. Here we are. It's open. It's official. Uh, oh man, I can't believe I'm reading this. Okay, January 12th, 2011. Oh man, guys. Oh, I feel emotional. Hold on. All right, hold on. Let me just gather my thoughts here. Ugh. 
the first sentence in my journal. Give me one second, guys. All right, we're going to read this. All right, January 12th, 2011. Today, my life got flipped upside down. I finally gave everything to God and he overwhelmed me with the Holy Spirit. He showed me that he showed me what my future would be. I'm an end time warrior. These are the first things in my journal, guys, from an atheist the day after getting saved. I am an end time warrior. He gave me a vision. I was in North Korea on the front lines of an army of spiritual warriors. Everything was black and white. And as he poured out the Holy Spirit, color began to come back into the people's faces. The despair of the people there was something like I've never seen. I did not realize how life changing this was till now. This was my first vision. The first time I seen my calling, my destiny, my life, me preaching before people. I would change millions of lives. Oh, sorry guys. Give me a second. This night I got new eyes after church. I couldn't recognize anyone or anything. The dirty scales have been removed. All right. January 13th, 2011. Wow. I'm starting to feel the Holy spirit. His presence is more than I can imagine or handle. My mindset is fresh. I can't see anything the same. The old me has gotten wiped off the earth. Uh, excuse me. I'm at school seeing the power of God everywhere. I'm looking around for lost souls. I'm understanding my calling and my purpose. It's almost so intense for me to bear. I'm craving prophecy, but the Lord is saying, be patient. Again, some of this stuff is raw guys. It's not going to be theologically correct because I had just gotten saved. So if you're a theologian here, like that's not biblical, just bear with me. January 14th, 2011. My life is changing so fast. Excuse me. God is showing me so much and I'm still trying to control all this prophetic power and all these gifts he's entrusted in me. This is, this is something like I've never experienced before. January 15th, 2011. I stayed up all night again, speaking about the Holy Spirit. This is now what? 12, 13, 40, three days later. I stayed up all night again, speaking about the Holy, Holy Ghost and trying to understand. I had two very important dreams of the future. The first dream, I was looking at a sea of people and I was hearing their thoughts and, uh, and it was happening in seconds. God was stressing that this was fast. I seen their entire lives in seconds. The second dream, there was a sea of diverse people. Each person had a cord connected to them. They were all connected. God is showing me that there are people that are all over the world connected somehow spiritually. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, this day, the Lord was testing me with old desires and told me, if I give in, you will lose everything. He told me as fast as I've given you all this is as fast as you can lose it if you give in to temptations. January 16th, 2011. Listen to this, guys. <laughs> this is all real, by the way. There you go. If you're not wondering, this is, I'm not reading off a script. January 16th, I stayed up all night again. So here you're seeing the theme. For those of you that don't believe my testimony, here you go. I stayed up all night again. I talked about God all night and I got, uh, and I received the power of prophecy. Uh, let's see. Let me find here where I'm at. Oh, I'm supposed to go to Fresno. Okay, so what was going on here was my girlfriend lived in Fresno and I pretty much lived with her at the time and she was going back to Fresno and her parents wanted me to go back to her. And in my mind, I knew that if I went with my girlfriend to Fresno and stayed the night with her, I would backslide and everything would be done. Everything would be gone. I, would, I wouldn't be here today. So this is what I'm writing about my journal. I said, I'm supposed to go to Fresno, but I have a horrible feeling about it. Like I'm going to war tonight. I'll be tested, but I'm ready to pass the test. God. And then I wrote God intervened and I didn't go to Fresno, but I found out the girl that I've been with for four years is my downfall who quenches my fire. It's the hardest test yet, but I must press on with God's call. If I do what he asked, if I do what he asks fast, the power of God will be potent. So this is when God told me, this is January 16th, to break up with my girlfriend. I was with for four years, living with pretty much. And uh, the whole story of how I didn't go to Fresno is, is to share another time. But pretty much God supernaturally hit her car keys so we couldn't go. It was a crazy story, but I basically knew that if I went then I would backslide and sleep with her and, and go back to the world. And so that was what I was talking about. January 17th, 2011. It's been two days. Okay, this is January 17th. Listen to this. It's been two days of no sleep. That's how intense the Holy Spirit has been. Tonight, God told me that we must pray. I broke up with Mackenzie. So this is January 17th. Like God has asked me to, and I'm ready for his blessings. Prayer was incredible. Listen to this. God used me to cast out 24 demons. The spirit is increasing. God showed me I will be mocked and killed for the gospel, but I'm ready for that sacrifice. He showed me uh, the, his power today. Thank you, God. 
January 17th, 2011, I said, God showed me I'll be mocked and killed for the gospel. I cast out 24 demons. You guys want me to keep going? Type one. Okay, I got a lot here. January 19th. Hold on. Let me make sure I'm not skipping. Was that 19th? Yeah. Okay, so I wasn't journaling every day. It was every few days. January 19th, 2011. Wow, I was late to work. I slept for one hour, but I don't even care. The physical pain I'm in is unbearable. This is when I got delivered. So this is January 19th when I got deliverance. I have demons living in me. It's not possession, but I'm afflicted. I'm seeing so much prophecy. Everyone I look at, God has given me a word for. Um, I prophesied to my sister and God told me it's time for her breakthrough. She casted four demons out, out of me and it's her first time in the power of God. Again, this is some of the stuff is hard for me to read, guys. It's, I mean, it's literally hard to read. Like, I'm, I'm not, some of it doesn't even make sense. Thank God for letting me help her. So my little sister casted demons out of me and this is what I wrote. Thanks God for letting me help her because... God used her to cast demons out of me. And in my mind, I was helping her by letting her practice deliverance on me. There is one more demon that must come out. This is warfare, all caps. Tonight was unreal. I felt the power of God. Thank you, God, I've been delivered. Okay, January 20th. Some of this is so funny, guys. January 20th, 2011. God moved mountains today. I spoke in front of 500 kids. This is when I went and spoke at a school. Someone invited me to, and I started speaking, casting out demons from a school, and uh, it, w it went crazy. I spoke it to 500 kids. It was amazing. The breakthroughs in my friends and family are overwhelming. That was January 20th. January 25th, 2011. God is moving so fast, I can't even keep up with journaling. The first prayer meeting we had, 50 people showed up and God moved. Again, guys, for those who are like, oh, that many people didn't come. This is January 25th. 50 people came and God moved. It's still all unreal, but I love it. Feelings I've never felt and people I've never met all day. I had a prophetic dream. Uh, it was the end of the world and I kept yelling, use the power of God. The end is here. I'm having insane end time dreams every night. They're hard to decipher. I don't want to lose my fire. There's so much at risk. Uh, one week and so much stuff has changed. Thank you, God. This is war. And then I wrote in my journal, P.S. The devil is a liar. <laughs> All right. January 26th. Today was amazing. My cousin got completely transformed. Thank you, God, for fulfilling your promise. I prophesied to someone at the gym and he's hungry for God. Every day is one step closer to my desk today. Nothing can stop me. January 27, 2011. Today was probably the most challenging since my life got changed. My school drains me. Um, I think this whole McKenzie situation is about to hit me. Time to pray for an hour and go to sleep. I have to press on. Okay, January 28th, 2011. Today was rough. The devil's using everyone and everything against me. The Lord has given me clear understanding to see who he is using. God is stripping everything from me and preparing me for my destiny. The world is calling and it's, uh, the world is waiting or calling and it starts in Hawaii. I don't know what that means. I'm seeing people in a new light and it's overwhelming, but it's necessary. The intimacy, the intimacy with God is what refuels me. This is war. I don't know why after every journal entry, I keep writing, this is war. All right, January 29th, 2011. Everything God's been showing me is happening. God's speaking through me and it's hard for people to co comprehend. I'm an empty vessel willing to sacrifice everything to pray, any, everything and anything, time to pray. God is about to show up and replenish me with, prayer was amazing and I wrote intimacy is key. January 31st, 2011. Monday night prayer was insane. God showed showed up so strong. Lives were changed. God used my brother uh, to speak to me about my future, saying that pro he prophesied over me I was going to change the world. My vision was reaffirmed. I had my first dream um, from the devil. I was in a mansion in every room. There were temptations of the world, and the devil has been plotting against me. Uh, let's see. The devil is in my life every day, but now I just laugh at him. I don't give the devil any satisfaction. Every situation the devil brings, God turns it around and turns it into something amazing. God's power is endless. And once we realize we're able to tap into that, revival is here and it's strong. I'm walking the narrow path. I'm walking like someone from the Bible, rising up an army. I will die for God. He showed me I will. And it makes me feel at ease. A crazy thought, but an amazing sacrifice. I'm learning the power of prayer. Intimacy is the key. Prayer, prayer, prayer. We need it with, uh, we need it. I don't even know what I mean there. I, it's, I put, we need it with the spiritual level. God is taking things to a new level, something different, something so real, it's unreal. I'm the burning one. I'm ready to subdue nations. Another night of no sleep. This is the constant theme in my journal. I'm not sleeping tonight, I'm praying. It's God's way. Every day, a fresh experience, renewal of my spirit daily. Okay, d February 2nd, 2011. Lives are being transformed so quickly, I'm in revival. The devil continues to try and lie and stop our prayer meetings, but it, but we must keep going. Church was awesome. It was all worship. It's what I needed. God is so real. I must never forget that, ever. I can't wait to see what God has, has in store for tomorrow. D February 
uh, 3rd, 2011. Amazing day. I prayed for two hours and then I worshiped for two hours. I'm trying to learn how to translate tongues. <laughs> All right, here we go. There's so much opposition. Oh, wait. I hope God gives me the gift to translate tongues. There's so much opposition for Monday night, but nothing is going to stop this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're in a spiritual war and I'm an end time warrior. January, uh, February 4th. Good day today. God revealed more stuff to help me see people as they are. I watch fierce love and I realize the power of love, the true tangible power. I'm ready for more breakthrough tomorrow. January or February 7th, 2011. Monday night was amazing. Okay, listen to what I say here. This is so cringe, but listen. I slayed nine people in the Holy Spirit. God kept showing up and showing off. I can feel the anointing stronger. About 70 people came tonight and I got five prophecies that were all confirmed from about me being a chosen vessel of God. Okay, one prophecy was about persecution, but I'm, I'm not afraid. I don't serve a God of doubt or fear, but of love and war. I love how I'm preaching myself in my journal here. I will go to barren lands and preach the word. I will die for God. I'm ready to suffer, to change lives. The Bible didn't say living for God is easy. I'm ready. There's a lot of me dying for God in here. And I, and I believe one day I probably will. Again, this has never been read. I've never shared this with anybody. So you guys are the first ones to hear it tonight. February uh, 9th, 2011. Crazy day. I cast out two strong demons and I wrote the person's name. Um, hate and Cain. I controlled, uh, let's see, I, God protected me and his life got changed. It's sad how demons are so common, but everyone's so scared to talk about them because they're uneducated. Wow. February 2011, I'm spitting facts here. School's my ultimate test. It drains me. The devil is trying to creep in. He's nonstop, but so am I, and so is my God. The church is even talking about the Monday revival. It's a sad reality. I had a dream. Um... Let's see. I w oh, I had a dream and I was preaching and I woke up listening to myself preach. So weird. Every day I get a fresh outpouring experience. I'm the burning one and I will not be contained. God's love is so deep and tangible and it blows my mind. I thank God every second for using me to change so many lives. It's so funny how the devil thinks he can stop me. My God is a God of light. Nothing can stop that. And then I wrote love with a smiley face. <laughs> all right. J February. Uh, this is a long entry. I probably read it all. February 12th, 2011. I was at a conference. God is moving. The sermon tonight was exactly my life. Uh, the church is making me hold back this burning power inside of me. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts to not prophesy because they told me you can't be prophesying over everybody and trying to slay everyone in the spirit. So I wrote here, the church is holding me back. It hurts to not prophesy and pray for people to be slain in the spirit, to not share visions or cast out demons because the church was telling me, hey, you can't be trying to cast demons out of everybody. I'm ready to go out and change the world. It starts in this sleeping generation. This world, this world is going to turn back to God because they've. Or what did I? What am I saying? This world turned its back on God. Now He's turning His back on us. I'm taking back my generation. That's a promise. Revival is here, and we're overdue. We need it. We're a starving generation for a historic outpour. It's time for, it's time for intimacy. And then I wrote again about the service. I wrote here, Satan, get behind me. You're a joke. <laughs> February twenty second. 2011. I haven't journaled in a while. I've been so busy. I overcame the sickness thanks to God's supernatural strength. The devil's been trying everything possible to pull people away from their call, but I will not let him win. He just keeps failing. Friday, I had the chance to speak at a conference. Over 250 leaders and the president of the movement. It was a divine appointment. They said we're an answer to prophecy to what God's been saying he's going to do. He's poured out multiple anointings. Acceleration anointing. I wrote about all these anointings. I had a dream. I was at a satanic festival and I was watching them from afar and they chased me into a house trying to mutilate my body. Jesus came as a man and saved me. I said, Jesus, is that you? He said, yes. I could not look or remember his face, even though he left, uh, he left, but they're still trying to kill me. I cried out to him and he said, I'm still here. Just because you don't see me doesn't mean I'm not there. God is so real. Wow. These are intense dreams. February 30th, 2011. The last few days have been crazy. Every day, something new. Monday night, 70 plus people came and God touched them. It was so intense. I cast out demons from my friend and he got completely changed. I'm up to now 29 demons cast out of people. I'm a warrior. And then I put, I had three, I had three visions. Um, I got sucked out of my body in prayer. I was floating and I saw a pyramid collapsing. Second vision was a staircase with flags from all nations. The flags started folding into each other down the stairs. Canada was the last flag to fold. Last, the third vision I had, I saw a demonic flag and the red outline shown evil. And then I wrote the, I wrote it. You guys want to see this? This is so cringe. I wrote the flag and then I wrote the bottom. The end is near. I'm a prophetic warrior. I'm seeing the future. I have work to do. Look at, hold on. Let me show you this flag that I wrote. 
That's the flag. It has a cross, a snake. It's so cringe, guys. But I wrote the vision. All right. <laughs> March 3rd. I can't show you too long because I already know you guys are going to snapshot it and be weird. March 3rd, 2011. Today was amazing. God moved so hard. I went to in and out and I witnessed to six atheists for an hour and I let the Holy Spirit speak to me. And then I wrote Matthew 10, 20, for we do not speak, but the Holy Spirit speaks through us. Those, uh, let's see, I remember this day. I argued with all these atheists at in and out Thank you, God, for making today possible. I'm nothing without the Holy Spirit. One word energized by the Holy Spirit can change everything. Something is around the corner. I can feel it. It's time to wake up. March uh, 16th. I don't know where to start. God has been stunning me every day. Last Monday, it went from 80 people to now 120 people are coming to my house every day. Oh, wait. Now this Monday was almost 200 people. So eight, I put 80 people to 120. Now we're at almost 200 people. This is February 16th. This is straight revival, just like my vision of Mondays. The devils, demons are everywhere. I can't believe how hidden it is from the world. The last three days, I delivered three people. Told you guys I used to do deliverance back in the day. I started out. This is in my blood here. The last three days, I delivered three people. The first, and then I wrote all the people what the demons' names were, which I won't share because, you know what I mean? And then I put, uh, okay. They said they wanted to kill me, blah, blah, blah. I realized demons are real and demons are common. The Bible says we don't, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against spirits. Why doesn't anyone get that? Why does nobody talk about demons? I love fighting demons and working for God. It's the best feeling in the world. My girlfriend is blowing up. Um, oh, wait, no, uh, sorry. GF is blowing up. Our ministry was called Generation Fellowship. So I put GF. I thought I said girlfriend, but it says GF is blowing up and God is taking everyone to new heights. Revival has started. He only needs one person to change the world. I'm taking my generation back. And then I have here a demon count. So I used to keep track of all the demons I cast out and how many people. So I put demon count, 40 demons back to the pit. That was my demon count. I used to literally keep track. Okay. So yeah, February, March 3rd, uh, March 16th, I'd cast out 40 demons at the time. I don't know when I stopped keeping track, probably towards the end of this. I'm going to go for a couple more, a couple more here, guys, because I'm entertaining myself. February, I'm sorry, March 22nd. Tuesday night, I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Every day gets better, fresh revelation. Weird, I'm in everyone's dreams, but I'm not dreaming. I must get into the word more. It's time to read. Wow, insane night, over a hundred, uh, I can't read that, something people. 180, 200 people. My best friend got delivered from the spirit of lust, uh, loneliness, sadness, depression, and what else? They all went to the pit. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. Without you, I'm nobody. I'm in awe. Demon count, 46 demons. <laughs> I love how I have a demon count. I said demon count, nine people, 46 demons. And then I wrote in the bottom, warfare. Look at it. That's the bottom. Warfare. There's my chicken scratch handwriting. All right. This is the only time I'm ever going to share this. So I might as well just go for it here. March 28th says, wow, I can't even journal. There's too much to say. Uh, spoke at a conference. It was amazing weekend. I spoke to over 20 pastors. Oh, over 20 pastors impartation. We did two healing sessions. The first lady I prayed for got healed of heart failure. Her shoulder was out of place and her leg was literally popped out. As I prayed, I can feel it moving in my hand. I never forget this moment where I felt the lady's bones moving in my hand. It was truly incredible. I was able to speak at the conference for 30 minutes and it came out perfect. The Holy Spirit never lets me down. I'm literally like, I, hey, I write this in my journal. I spoke for 30 minutes and it came out perfect. The Holy Spirit never lets me down. That's so funny. I'm like, that was a great word, Isaiah. I did an altar call of fire at the end. Okay, altar call of fire. I see you, Isaiah. And then I said, uh, Corey Russell encounter. I got a prophetic word in front of the church saying your hands are gold revealing fire. I don't even know what this is. I can't even read this. And then I said, went to the streets tonight and I scared a witch doctor and I prayed healing over a woman with a walker and she got healed. The spirits are pouring out and doors are opening faster than I could walk through. I need to quit my job. Listen to what I wrote here. February 28th, I said, I need to quit my job. Too much wasted time. Lord, open a, a financial door, please. Thank you. I love you, Jesus. Just in case you forgot, Lord, I love you. So go ahead and let me quit the job now. All right, March 30th. Tuesday was incredible. Over 200 people came and God showed up and showed off. About 10 healings broke out and a lot of hands and legs were healed. All different people and lives radically changed. We are in a healing season. I had two dreams last night, finally. First um, was my girlfriend came to our Tuesday night service and I told her what had been going on and gave her closure. Uh, the dream was about closure, okay? I didn't write what it was about. I guess my girlfriend came to the revival. Which, by the way, I broke up with this girl that I was with for four years through a text message and I've never talked to her since. So that's why in here I'm like, okay, we never had closure because we literally have never talked since then. Second, I was at a cottage rebuking demons in the house. 
Okay, so I was delivering people at a cottage. God is so stunning. This is what, January, February, March, April 10th now. Wow, incredible stuff's been happening. Obviously, you guys can tell I'm not journaling every day now. I'm journaling like every 20 days. Incredible stuff's happening. I went to minister in Sanger. I preached at a church. Um, going on 17th to bring revival to Patterson. I'm confident God will show up. I delivered somebody again. My demon count's about 60. So now we're at 60 demon count here, guys. Continuing to be a soldier and wage war with against Satan. No longer waiting for the attack. I'm declaring all out war and I'm going to be the first to attack Satan. Had a vision that there were tons of doors and as I chose one to go through, more appeared. I seen a page writing but couldn't make out what it said. The cry of the hour is God, I want more. I'm starving for a fresh encounter with the living God. The Bible's so clear when it says a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. So much opposition. My main focus is to be 100% led by the Spirit of God. The presence of the Spirit shifts people and churches go from survival to revival. There's some good stuff in here, guys. I must journal more. God, give me time. Putting all my trust in him and relying on his word, I feel myself maturing in Christ. Quickly, the Spirit is upon me. Lord, help me stay out of the way so you can, uh, you can drive my life. Let me live out the calling on my life. I need you. I'm almost done, guys. I got like two more pages here. Okay, April 20th. So many things going on. It's hard to journal and too much to say. Last week, went to Patterson. Tons of miracles broke out. Over 200 people, um, over 250 people are coming to my house. Signs and wonders are breaking out. Open heavens, healings, deliverances. The spirit is pouring out and so many doors are being opened. I'm ready to go to the nations and take down a corrupt world order. Wow, okay, I see you. I will stand and fight. Satan tries so hard to stop me, but I have the keys. Ministered, okay, and outgrow, felt the spirit, grieved. Oh, okay, I see that. I named a pastor. I said I ministered with him, but I felt him grieving the spirit. Getting pro so much prophecy and confirmation. This is revival. I'm desperate. I'm thirsty for more. I have like one or two more journal entrances here. April 22nd, ministered in Outgrove again. It was incredible. The power of God showed up. Healings broke out. All glory to God and him only. Man, the biggest enemy is the spirit of religion. I bind and break you. I cannot wait to see more old friends on fire. It's all in this perfect time. I love I love God. And April 12th. Oh, wait. April 22nd. The date must be wrong here. This must be April 23rd. I feel horrible. Oh, no. Let me see. I, I messed up here somewhere. I don't know what, but it's the 12th. I think it's May, maybe? I feel horrible. I haven't journaled in so long. So many things are happening. I'm getting overwhelmed. I've been too... Uh, I went to Sacramento and preached... The last entry has been crazy, or the last service has been insane. Over 250 people blowing my mind, healings, miracles, deliverances, ankles, cancer gone, diabetes gone. God is opening up doors, had a vision. Uh, the city was upside down. I'm ready to flip the city upside down. And then I talked about, I did more deliverances. I'm up to 54 demons cast out now for my demon count. And then I wrote, revival is God's arrival. Praying hard every day, God saves my ex-girlfriend. I know he will. He won't break the promise. I'm just impatient. The dreams are gone, but the memories aren't. Fa uh, Father, help me. I need to focus on what he's doing instead of what he hasn't done. Let me look back and read this. Uh, let me look back and read this and remember how good he is. He's truly too good. Wow. Let me read that again. I wrote this in my journal. This was, I think, May 12th, 2011. I said, let me look back on this and read this and remember how good he is. 11 years later, I'm reading this, how good the Lord is. Okay, I got two more entries and, I'm, and it's done here. Sadly, the journal goes blank. Uh, this is going to be now this. Okay, this is March 20th. So it's out of order here somehow. So the last few days have been crazy. I'm dealing with a lot of deliverances. People are manifesting nonstop. And then, and then this is actually when my wife got delivered, who obviously wasn't my wife at the time. But I wrote down Alyssa got delivered and I wrote all the stuff she got delivered from. This was my first time encountering. Okay, <laughs> okay, I won't say because I don't know if she wants me to. But I said the next two days I delivered and I wrote their names down. 10 demons, 10 generations back. Unf okay, I wrote all the names of the demons. I'm at 84 demons cast out total now. So many healings, miracles. Last week, a deaf lady got her hearing back. Too many healings to write down, tearing down the gates of hell. And then uh, this is my last journal entry. It feels bad. May 26, 2011 is my last journal entry. Okay, and, and then we're going to pray and be done. I spoke at a... Uh, service on Sunday. It was amazing. Over a thousand people, incredible amount of healings and miracles. God moved in such a strong way. I spoke on Wednesday and I named the church. God moved again. It's impossible to keep up with all the miracles. Thank God he's way too good. I had two dreams today. One was me getting attacked by demons. The second I went into the living room and there was a huge storm hitting Manteca. My uncle was sitting on the couch and I seen a huge tornado about to hit the city. And I told him that I told him, is that going to hit us? He said, yes. Are you ready? It was so real. Excuse me. 
I couldn't believe it. Something big is happening. I'm so ready to travel and go into the world, but it's still all in God's timing. I'm speaking in July at a Burning Ones conference, and I'm excited. God's redefining my thoughts on marriage and relationship. All in his time. Tuesdays have been mind-blowing. So this is the last part of my journal here. Tuesdays have been mind-blowing. The outpouring is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Prayer tonight, ready for more breakthrough. The last sentence of my journal is prayer tonight, ready for more breakthrough. That is it, guys. That is my journal from the first few months of me getting saved. I pray you are blessed tonight. Let us pray. Oh, the videos. We forgot to show. Okay, let's show the videos. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, we're going to show a video of the house. This was one of the nights Amber Brooks came and you can just see people outside. Again, people were outside. They were, we had a big living room. Then we had a kitchen. Then we had another living room and then people would line up outside. They would literally be outside listening through the windows. So let me show a clip of that here. I totally forgot. Let's look at this video. Thank you in the comments for reminding me. Demon count 84 demons plus. I love that. It's so, that's so awesome. Okay. I'm gonna show you the house and I'm gonna show you me preaching at the house. This is hard for me to watch, but I'll get through it, okay? We're gonna get it. It's hard for me to watch me preach, but it's not hard to watch the footage of the house because it's amazing. So here's the house, here we go. All right, let me make sure. Right, here we go. I'm just gonna skip here. See, there's people outside in the windows, looking through the windows. And sadly, we didn't even open the blinds for them right there. All outside those windows, you'll see. I'll show you them after. and there was another living room back there. People were in. speaker. Look at people sitting at our feet. Literally they sit on my feet. Look at outside. That's the front of the house, outside. It would be safe to say that you can't lose with the stuff we use. <laughs> right. 
That was all around the house that you couldn't even see the other side of the house, the porch. Don't, hey, don't be recycling now. <laughs> Anyways, I don't want. That's my uncle talking right know, now. We, we don't want to. Uh, take wow, that's incredible. Okay, let's watch one of me preaching. Again, I'm just gonna skip to a random part, but this was me preaching in my living room in 2011 here. So I'll skip to a part. Who knows what I'm gonna say? Who knows what's gonna come out of my mouth here? So. Uh, yeah, we'll just listen here. Let's see what happens. Let's see. Let's just skip here. Oh, let's see. Is it going to work? A lot to do and a lot of God's doing some crazy stuff, so I can sit up here for hours. Let's like two minutes. So we look at the church and we understand this. We understand it's not a building, it's a group of people. And there's this question. It's sad if you look through the church. If you go up and just start interviewing people in this room that go to church, is God real? And I guarantee 80% of people in the church would not be able to say yes or no. Like, do you know if God's real or not? A hundred percent, you'd say, I felt God, I've seen God, I've seen the sick be healed, I've seen demons There's cast people out. sitting on my 80% feet. Eighty percent of the church does not believe God is real. We serve a mystical God, we have no idea, and the church tells us this, it's a mystical thing you don't have to be able to prove. No, no, no. If your church is telling you you don't need to be able to prove God, that's a lie from Satan. You should be able, the reason why Jesus said this, he said, don't believe me, this crazy kid, don't believe what I'm saying, I hope you don't sit in this room and believe me. I hope you take it before God and say, God, is what he's saying real? God, is the words he's speaking real? Line it up, see, but most of us don't read our Bibles, we blindly follow a pastor, and Jesus Preach. said this in John 10, 38, he said, if you don't believe in me. If you don't believe the words Isaiah speaks, if you don't believe the um, testimony Sammy's giving, he says, believe the signs and wonders that follow and know that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. So as Christians, we are supposed to be able to demonstrate our walk. Because we have so many people that wear a label but cannot back it up with a the lifestyle. They can't. It's like this. It's like if you're in the hospital and you're wearing a doctor's cloak and you tell everyone you're a doctor and you have the degree and you act like a doctor and you look like a doctor and you walk like a doctor. See, but when surgery comes and you're not really a doctor and you've been faking it to make it your entire life and you get in the surgery room and when the heat hits and, and everything is around you and you, someone needs to get healed and you're sitting in the surgery room and you say I don't know how to do this I told everyone I had everyone fooled I was a Christian I've been living this lukewarm Christianity I had everyone fooled and I have this question why do we fake Christianity you can pre you can pretend you're a Christian and be lukewarm all you want because that's what's plaguing America, right? In America, lukewarm Christianity has been plaguing us. But the bottom line is when you stand before God, nobody's full. He is not. You, you can fool everyone. And I have this question. If you fool everyone, right? Say you fool everyone and you pretend you're a Christian and you die. And you stand before God and you go to hell. Are you going to be sitting in hell saying, they all think I'm in heaven? I had all of them fooled up there into thinking I was going to make it to heaven. You're still in hell! Do you get what I'm saying? Like, if you fool everyone with this whole lukewarm Christianity stuff the church talks about, and you're in hell, and you say, okay, everyone up there knows I'm in heaven. What? Th this is the reality. And it's and we got to get real. Guys, listen, you listen, the listen. In the window. we got to get real. we got to get serious and look at ourselves. Am I really a Christian? Am I really casting out devils and healing the sick like the Bible says Christians should be doing? We need to get serious and get real. Because the truth is, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about souls here. And a lot of us as Christians, we fall asleep in the light. Have you ever fallen asleep in the light? Like, you know the truth, and you're still sleeping. And you fall asleep, but you're watching TV, and it's the lights on, and you fall asleep, and you wake up. What's the first thing you do? Where am I? Whoa. How did I fall asleep? I don't remember falling asleep. How did I fall asleep? When did this happen? Until you come into the awakening, and someone comes up to you and wakes you up. And so we testify. That's what I was going to talk about. I'm going to skip it all. We testify, not only to prove God's real, because it's not about feelings, it's about facts. You can say, I feel old man crying. Is God real or is not God real? Because God's either real or he's not. Either people get healed or they don't get healed. If God's real, the devil's real. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, it's a yes or a no. There's no middle ground. The Christians walk this, luke, um, this lukewarm middle ground. Well, bro, there's two roads. I just want to tell you, you don't all have to be so radical. I'm, you don't all. I say, what? You don't all know. There, I say there's some people. Oh my gosh, this is making me mad. I say there's some people who aren't called to be radical. Like there's some people. Oh wait, wait. There's another road. So you have a narrow road and a wide road, and then a carpool lane. No, no, no. There's no middle road. You're all called to be radical. To Transform and started the church. Everything is revolved around. It's not about church. It's about transformation. Because when you get transformed, you now want to go to church. I hate worship. I hate. See, this is this is what I'm trying to say. So, I, I remember meeting a guy, and, and I'll give you testimony since we're talking about how real God is and how awesome God is. And this kid uh, was sitting in my car, and we're on our way. His first time going to church, and he starts beginning to tell me 
about his life. And he says, you know, bro, there was a moment in my life where I was sitting in my house. He said, and something, something came over me. He said, I don't know what it was, but something evil came over me. And he said, and I never told anyone this before. I'd never said, and this is your first person that you're hearing this, and I'm driving in my car about to get an accident. And he says, something came over me. He says, there was a gun in my dad's, in my dad's drawer. And he said, this thing, I, I don't know what it is. The church doesn't talk about demons, so I'm not sure what this thing is. But it comes over my body, and this thing told me to grab the gun, and it literally took over my body. It wasn't like I was thinking it and, oh, wow, I want to kill. And it said, kill your mother and your father, and then kill your, your brothers and sisters right now. So this thing takes over his body, and he begins to walk to get the gun, and he said, something else took over my body. Uh -huh. He said, something else showed up. And the thing that showed up was more powerful than the thing that was trying to control me. And he said, and he said this thing shows up and tells me to run. It tells me, run now, run. And he says he got and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran. And then God changes him. God uses him. God puts him. This is, listen, this is not church. This is transformation. Yes. And he's in me. He's here today. Preach. He's part of my ministry. He's one of the strongest leaders I have. He's changing the world. He's casting out devils. He's healing the sick. He's letting people know. And God did this to me. He can do it for you. Because in testimony, reminds us of what God did so we know what he can do. A testimony opens up a realm of opportunity because you say, if I say it's family and their marriage, do you know this time last year my dad was sitting in Whoo! I'll, I'll shout myself down there. So the guy I was talking about in the story is still serving God to this day, and he runs all the prayer teams at the church I go to right now. And casts out demons, does deliverance. Eleven years later, he's still serving God, so the fruit remains. I am fired up, guys. I'm telling you. It's just like so nostalgic to go back and watch those videos. I hope tonight you kind of saw where I came from. You kind of see my roots now of revival in my home, why I preach the way I preach. And as you can see there, I've been preaching that same message for 11 years, repentance, revival. There's only one road. It's the narrow road. And I'm going to keep preaching that for the rest of my life. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much. God, for what you're doing, Lord, I know that you're going to do it again, that there's going to be people watching this broadcast, that you're going to bring revival to their marriages. You're going to bring revival to their families. You're going to save their children, that Lord, let revival start in homes in Jesus' name. God, the same thing you've done in my life, you've taken me from being an atheist to a revivalist. I pray, Lord, tonight that you would touch those that are atheists, those that are broken, those that are lost, those that are hurting. Lord, I pray, start revivals in homes, God. Start radical Christianity in homes, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would do what only you can do. Pour out your spirit, God. Pour out your anointing. Pour out your fire. Do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to move with power, to move with authority, to let your anointing flow, that God, you would do it again, that you are the God that does it again, that these are not just stories, but God, these are, these are your stories. These are your testimonies of what you've done in our life, what you've really done, God, in my life. Father, I thank you. I glorify you that I give you all the honor and glory. I pray, Lord, everybody watching this would get re revived tonight. This would spark a new hunger in you, a new passion in you a new desire in you to get in prayer, to get in the word. Lord, tonight, do what only you can do. Raise up deliverers, raise up end time warriors, raise up revivalists, God. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. Come on, I believe it tonight, guys, as I shared my testimony fully, I've never shared my testimony for an hour and a half ever. So I pray that this would bless you, it would encourage you. Again, if you want to support us, you can on our website, isaiahsaldiver.com slash giving, all of, I'm slash partner, all of our content is free. We don't do this for money. It's not about income. It's about outcome. 11 years later, I'm still going strong. Thankfully, I don't work at Starbucks anymore. So in my journal, I'm like, Lord, please deliver me from this job. Thankfully, I can do this full time now. I'm now married. If you didn't know, I have four kids. Justice is seven. Journey is five. Harvest is three. And Nova is one. I've been married. It'll be 10 years in September. And I'm here today still preaching the same word still preaching the same message of deliverance, casting out demons, healing the sick, repentance, the narrow road. What I'm going to do, guys, probably is I'm going to upload a few of these old sermons. If you want to hear some of these, let me know in the chat. I'm going to upload a few of these super old sermons because I have a ton of them on YouTube unlisted that I can upload. But I'm thinking about uploading some of them just so we can go down memory lane here and watch some of these old videos. I cringe at it, but I don't, but I don't at the same time, because this is what God has done in my life. And 
it's amazing what God has done. And I, I still feel like I'm dreaming. Again, I'll, st I'll say what I started with. 11 years later, I feel like I'm in a dream. And that's how God wants all of our lives to be. God wants to give you that life where you feel like you're dreaming because only he can do it. All right, that was amazing tonight. I feel refreshed and excited, guys. Again, that was the first time I've ever, ever read in my journal. That was You guys are the first people that have ever heard my journal, period. I've never showed anybody, read it to anybody. So it was special to share that with you guys. If you want to sow into the ministry, become a monthly partner, you can. We do need you guys to partner with us, okay? We're not this whole huge $10 million uh, ministry with 50 employees. It's just me and my brother, and then we have a girl that works part-time on the deliverance map and gets back to emails every day there because we have to have somebody doing the deliverance map every day. But yeah, it's just, just us three, and uh, we do need your help and appreciate your help. And if you want to give, you can. I'll upload the videos. I will. I will. Maybe maybe this week I'll do it. Maybe on Thursday or, or Wednesday I'll upload some old videos, and you guys can see some, cla some revival classics. Again... I've gone through some of these videos and the message has never changed. It's been radical. People say, Isaiah doesn't preach radical or repentance. I'm like, what? I've been preaching this before it was cool. What are you talking about? I've been preaching this since, since 2011. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'll definitely upload them. Okay, I'm going to read some of the donations. Again, those of you that support us, thank you, thank you, thank you. All the links to give are there. The QR code is there. If you want to see that word on Molik, I've posted it on my Facebook, on my YouTube, all the channels. If you if you didn't catch that, what I posted about abortion, that the spirit of Molik is mad. It's the truth. We're in, we're in some real battles ahead, guys, but we are winning. The church is winning in Jesus' name. But let me read some of these. Awesome. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. We had awesome numbers. I think we had like 3,500 on or something. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's read through some of these. Danielle and um, Andref Andrefsky. Thank you so much, Danielle. I appreciate you. You are a legend. Certified. Anonymous, thank you. Anonymous, thank you. Whitney Nyland, thank you. It's so beautiful, Isaiah. I can listen to your testimony over and over. Thank you, Whitney Nyland. I appreciate you. Anonymous, thank you. Uh, Jansen Gonzalez. Say, God bless you, Isaiah. Thank you for preaching God's word. You've taught me a lot so far, and I'm so grateful for that. And then I have your prayer request there. I said, uh, I pray for you and your family as well. Thank you, Jansen. Anonymous, thank you. Jesse Bulmer said love you bro jesse thank you for the super generous donation that's huge thank you jesse i appreciate you literally it keeps us going thank you thank you thank you ashley said god bless you and your family thank you ashley jesse again thank you the davis family said awesome testimony isaiah i think end of days will um will be how it was in the beginning house churches don jackie and jay davis thank you davis family i love you and appreciate you you guys are amazing Okay, okay, okay. I'll change my color lights. I know. I used to do this all the time. It's like tradition, but but I stopped doing it. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Let's do... Let's see. Is that too much? Yeah, that one That one changes too much. Let's do like a... How about this one? Check one, two. Testing. Okay, we'll do a voice activated one. I see you in the chat. All right, I see you. Sarah, thank you so much. Mia Arias said, God bless you and your family. You're such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Raid Soul says, such a powerful testimony. God is so good. You're such a legend, bro. I love you and God bless. Raid, I love you. Thank you, Raid. You are a legend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Edwin. Edwin, what are you doing, dude? Thank you, bro, for that donation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Edwin, you didn't have to do that, bro. Thank you. Said, love and honor you with all my heart, Pastor Isaiah. You've been an absolute blessing to my life since the first live stream, and I appreciate you continuing to fight on every day. Thank you for tonight following you as you follow Christ. Edwin, thank you, bro. Edwin's been here since day one. I appreciate you, dude. You're a certified legend. Thank you. Kimberly, thank you. Lucas, thank you. Naren, thank you. Laquita, thank you. Joshua Luna, thank you. Said, love from Texas. Jim, the legend. All the legends in the chat giving tonight. Thank you, Jim. Say, come on, somebody. So good. Love you, bro. Thank you, Jim. I love you and appreciate you, man. Thank you. American Top Gunner. So thanks for all your knowledge. I want to be on your level one day. Thank you, American Top Gunner. I appreciate you. Thank you. Anonymous. Thank you. Amy Harris. Thank you. So your ministry has blessed me so much. God bless you and your family. Thank you, Amy. All right, guys. I'm going to read the Venmo. If you want to give on Venmo, you can. Excuse me, my lip is cut up from my braces. <laughs> All right, that's why I'm doing that. If you want to give on Venmo, you can. I'm going to go ahead and read the Venmo. Man, we went long. We've been live for an hour and 50 minutes. I was thinking like, oh, I'm not going to even be able to talk long enough, but we went way over, so praise the Lord. Man, I felt the Holy Ghost so strong when we had the house worship video. Okay, let's read the Venmo. If you want to give on Venmo, you can. There's no fees, so Venmo is like the best place to give. Um, thank you, guys. My Venmo is at Isaiah Saldivar. Yes, I'll be posting these old videos for sure. Okay, I'm going to read the Venmo right now. Right now, okay? 
All right, Gabby Hildago, thank you so much. And thank you, Jesus. Megan Duenas, and thank you so much for sharing your full testimony. This motivates me to start my demon count. Truly amazing, Isaiah. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Megan. That was awesome. Lucy, thank you so much. At dinner, thank you, Lucy. I appreciate you. Dennis. All right, let me try to say your last name, Dennis. Um, Adzaguri. Ad, let's see. Adzagare. I don't know. Adzagare. Thank you. So thank you. Keep dreaming. Thank you, bro. Dana Ramos said, thank you. Irene said, love watching you preaching from 2011. Thank you, Irene. Nancy Torres said, thanks for your testimony. Thank you so much, Nancy. Hannah McCutcheon said, so can I get one of those prophetic words you had to hold back? But really though, thank you so much, Hannah. I appreciate you. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. Fun Buns Hornick, thank you so much. Valerie Vigil said, thanks for sharing your amazing testimony. What a powerful night. Thank you, Valerie Vigil. Awesome. Tina Dugan said, tonight was great. Love seeing young Isaiah preach. Thank you, Tina Dugan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't even know what I keep saying in that video. Only God knows. I got to watch it before I, before I post it. I don't know. Okay. Okay, let me read some of the chat here. Is there any questions? All right. Anonymous said, your testimony was powerful. I'm grateful for your ministry. God bless you and your family. Also, thanks you have Prophet Lovi Elias on your podcast. It would be fire. I'll check him out. I'll check out Prophet Lovi. T-Dog, thank you. Kayoka Miller, thank you. Devin and Undra. So love you, Isaiah. You haven't changed much thank you for giving your life to christ and being obedient praying for you and everyone out here thank you devin thank you thank you thank you okay any questions while my lip is <laughs> bleeding over here no any questions guys you inspired our church to start doing deliverance awesome kira i love to hear it i love to hear it do you work out no but i'm gonna start I'm going to go look at gyms next week. I'm going to start getting in the gym. I need you for my health. Were you homeschooled? Yes, I was homeschooled. That is how I graduated at 16 from high school. Yes. Did you go to any Bible school? Yes, I went for almost four years to Bible college. I have a bachelor's degree in theology. Yes, I did a once a month accelerated learning Bible college. That was like 15 hours on Saturday or something like that. Lindsay Miller, thank you. Said Zoom testimony night. Love you and your ministry. That'd be awesome, Lindsay. Thank you. Pablo Felix, thank you. Said powerful testimony. Grateful for everything you do. How much do you sacrifice to do? Keep pushing. You're definitely a warrior. Thank you, Pablo. Lisa Marie said thank you, Pastor Isaiah, for all you do for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lisa. Angela Mason said thanks for letting God use you, inspiring revival in Boston. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, me writing in my journal, I'm going to reach millions is incredible because 11 years later, we are doing that. So that's just God. How far apart are you in age of your siblings? Two, we're all two years apart. So it goes, my brother's the oldest, then my sister Sunshine is young, is, you know, the second, and then I'm third, and then my little sister Cherish, who invited me to church. So Nico, Sunshine, Isaiah, and Cherish. That's four of us, and we're all about a year and a half apart. A year and a half, two years apart, give or take. God showed me the same vision. That's awesome, Troy. Mm -mm -mm. How do I register for the New Jersey event? It says sold out. Melanie, they're supposed to add, they're supposed to add room. So um, I will contact them and see. They're supposed to double it up and add more people because it's free. So a lot of people don't show up when it's free. But I'll see if they did, okay? Did your ex-girlfriend get saved? Unfortunately, no, she didn't. She didn't get saved. She actually went the very opposite of that. So I still pray for her though all the time. Is your brother's name Nicodemus? No, it's uh, Nick. His actual name is Nick. He's Nick the fifth. How do I get deliverance? Adam, go on my map. Go to IsaiahSaldivar.com. Uh, dot com slash deliverance find someone in your area on the map and contact them to get delivered this is my third month watching you arturo thank you for watching me he said i learned a lot awesome what was the name of the worship song it was come like you promised by amber brooks and i'm in such a good mood i'll type it out come like you promised amber brooks there you go there you go would love to see your parents, siblings, and grandma on the stream. That'd be awesome to have a whole family stream. We could definitely do that someday. She's not saved yet. No. Invite your wife on. My wife will be on soon. What's your demon count now? Oh, man. Thousands, I would guess. Yeah, go to my website, Adam. And you'll find a map. And the map is people that are willing to do deliverance on you. So you can contact them and they'll come meet you up, meet with you, and do deliverance with you. Clint and Terriano say, God bless you, Isaiah. I had to tell you it was in Bible study the other night, and the leader of the group mistakenly said Shadrach, Meshach. Uh, okay, I never felt so African-American, by the way. Great message in San Bernardino. Thank you, Clint. I appreciate you, man. That's hilarious. That's hilarious, Clint. Thank you. 
I don't know, but a lot. If you count mass deliverance, tens of thousands. I don't I don't know how you count it. We just at San Bernardino, we had several thousand there and we did mass deliverance. So do you want more kids? Uh, not right now, but we are going to do foster care and probably adopt, but we're for sure going to do foster care. I think in response to the whole thing with abortion, our part is foster care. So we're definitely going to be doing that. Do you speak Spanish or Italian? No, I speak in English and I speak in tongues. That's it. What if they don't answer back from the map? Contact somebody else. C contact multiple people. We do update it every single day. I don't know how many. Sorry, Isaiah. I was rude. Oh, I didn't see your thing. The neighbor complained with all those people. The good question. We lived out in the country. So our neighbors, we knew, we knew them a long time and they didn't really complain. We had five acres. So people would park in the back of our house. We had a five acre lot where people would park. So yeah, it was pretty wild though. The map isn't working. It should be working. Try a different browser or try a different um, computer. I just checked it. I'll check it again for you though. I'll tell you right now if it's working, okay? Uh, let's see. Oops. What am I doing? All right. The map. Let's see. I'm loading it right now. The map is working. I'm, I'm literally on it as we speak. In fact, I wish I could show you guys this map, but I don't have it set up. Next stream, I'm going to show you. I'll show you guys the map. Uh, Go to my website. Let's see. What do you mean you clicked? Let me try again. Let me go to my website and just see if it uh, if it works when I click that. Just go to IsaiahSaddle.com slash deliverance or go to my website and go to deliverance map. Um, it works for me. Maybe try a different browser. I'm using Google Chrome and it's working fine right now. My Discord is in the description. If you're looking for my Discord, it's literally in the description. And we have over 5,000 right now on there, which is amazing. The map works on my phone, guys. I don't know what to tell you. It's hard when you guys say it doesn't work because I can't fix it when it works on my phone and it works on my uh, computer. So you're going to have to try to just do something else, try something else, a different device. Freda Hill, thank you. Anonymous said, thanks for sharing the word with us all. You're an inspiration. I'm glad you answered God's call. Thank you, Anonymous. Gabby, thank you so much. I'll be getting off here in about five minutes. When are you coming to Brooklyn? I don't know as of right now. What material things should we get rid of in our homes? Anything that's demonic or anything that's an idol. Hopefully I'll be in North Korea one day. The map works for me. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you confirmed that. Do you know there's a rap song in reference to you, Spiritual Snipers? Yes. The person who did the rap song is my cousin, Z. Z is my literal cousin. He actually got saved at our revival. He was in the chat today. The guy who wrote Spiritual Sniper and did the song was in the chat. He's my cousin. So he's always in the chat. His name's Z Music. In the, in the YouTube, his name Z Music. Yeah, Z is my cousin. Most people do not know that. Did you say you're going to be killed for preaching the gospel? My journal does say that. So I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I will be. The college I attended was called Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute. And we did like a satellite school. It was based out of Canada, but it was fully accredited in the U.S. The deliverance map, I will type it in the chat for those of you that are asking for it again. Or my mods can do it, but I'll, I'll do it too. They could, we could both do it. There's the map link. And guys, I don't want to be rude. Every link you're looking for is down in the description. Literally every link. Mm-mm-mm. Is it true you were planning to come to Uvalde, Texas? Uh, no, I didn't have any plans to. How much did the Bible college cost? I don't remember, a few thousand a semester, but the pastor paid for it for me. He sponsored me and paid for it. There's the link. Thank you, mods. It's also down below. Did you get engaged the day you heard God say, Alyssa's your wife? No, I didn't get engaged uh, that day. We got engaged, I don't know, a few weeks later. Joy Perry, see your testimony really blessed me. It's amazing seeing God, powerful hand moving your life and making you a voice for his kingdom, bringing many souls in the kingdom. God is very pleased with you. You're on fire. God bless you. Thank you, Joy, for the support. Excuse me. Thank you, Joy. What kind of water am I drinking? Oh, uh, right now I'm drinking Costco. 
Although I don't know why I keep drinking bottled water when I have containers of water that I could just fill up or use. So I don't know. When are you coming to Colorado? I don't know. San Bernardino was awesome. It was amazing. I, I'm, unfortunately, I couldn't meet all you guys because I had to wake up the next day at like five in the morning and I had dinner with the pastors and there was like over 3,000 people that came to San Bernardino. So fortunately, I couldn't meet with you guys. couldn't say hi to everybody. It's too many people. Um, did your ex break up with you after you got saved or you bro uh, after you broke up? Wait, did your ex you broke up with get saved? No, she didn't get saved, Kelly. I'm still praying for her to get saved, but she did not get saved. No, the Bible college was a satellite school. It wasn't in Canada. It was just based out of Canada and they hosted it at my church, at the church I was going to. Advice on how to start casting out demons. Uh, watch my video and then get on our deliverance map or find somebody to do deliverance on and just do it. That's my advice. Oh no, Amber Brooks. I was just saying the song. People were asking, what was that song at my house playing? It was Amber Brooks. That's guys that in the video, that was Amber Brooks. <laughs> So she's the one that does the song and wrote it, but that was literally her at my house in the video. And that's how I ended up going to Morningstar and preaching with Reinhard Bonke is because Amber Brooks came to our house and then went back and told Rick Joyner about us. Does it cost to have you come speak? No, because I don't really take bookings right now. And most of the time I just give the money back to the church. Uh, I will be in Georgia. I'm going to be in Georgia this year. I'll be in Atlanta in November. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to be in Atlanta in November with Daniel Adams, John Ramirez, Vlad Sabchuk, Alexander Pagani, and Mike Signorelli and me. That's pretty wild. Six, all six of us are going to be in Atlanta. So I would definitely get on that. Daniel Adams page has registration and I'll post that soon too. Did God tell Alyssa that you'd be her husband at the same time? Uh, yeah, around the same time. Uh, I don't have any other dates for you guys, but that. Yes, I'll be with John Ramirez in November. How much is it? I don't know, Jenny, but I'll tell you that the night sessions are free. So I don't know how much the day sessions are in the whole conference, but if you go to the night sessions, they are free. Can't wait. My hotel's booked. Awesome. What are your thoughts on sneakerheads? Nothing. I don't have any thoughts on them. When will we be back to Life Song? July 31st. I'll be preaching all four services at Life Song. Is smoking cigarettes a sin? Yes. Destroying your body, which is what cigarettes do, is definitely sin. You're missing the mark if you're destroying your body. Cigarettes literally kill you in, in a literal sense. Uh, Irene said $75. Yeah, I think that's if you go to every session because there's like a bunch of sessions throughout the day, but the night sessions are free. So if you don't want to pay, just come to the night sessions. I think the building seats like four or 5,000. Do you still journal? No, I don't. This is my journal right here. I have video journal. <laughs> All right, guys. I love you. Thanks for the support. I love every single one of you. Again, pray about becoming a monthly partner. If you're not, thank you for giving. It keeps us going. I love you. I love you. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow night. We have an ex drag queen who's become a pastor. We're going to interview them, talk about the LGBTQ community and the drag queen agenda. It's going to be a good time. Um, don't miss that. God is on the move. I love you guys so much. Here you go. For those of you asking to see the bobblehead, the bobblehead is alive and well. He's not very tan as me, but he's still he's still here. Maybe we should put him out in the sun. He's still wearing a short sleeve, though. We need to paint Sharpie him a long sleeve, though. You know I don't wear short sleeves. All right. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Tonight was awesome. Thanks for hanging out for two hours. Goodbye. Love you. Bye. See you guys. Love you. Have a good night. My wife should be working right now, but she's in the chat. Hi, thanks for being here. Edwin, you're a legend, dude. Thank you. Love you guys. Good night. Sleep well. Yeah, I would love to have my family on the broadcast. How cool would that be? Ryan said, I felt the anointing with Bob. Really? Appreciate you, bro. The smoking cigarettes a sin? Yes, it is. Cigarettes kill you. P.S. The Devil is a Liar t-shirt, right? I love how every journal entry ended with The Devil is a Liar. <laughs>
Alright,